Hi, this is Kim, and this video is about HIV. You should have already watched the general video about viruses and how viruses reproduce before watching this video. So this shows you the basic structure of HIV, and you can see some of the key components of a typical virus in this diagram. I'm also going to show you a video of HIV reproducing. Because in the prior video, I listed the steps of viral reproduction, but I want you to see it in action. So this is just showing you some of those key enzymes. So here's protease, which remember was used to cut that polypeptide into functional proteins. Reverse transcriptase, which was used to convert viral RNA to viral DNA. And then integrase was used to integrate or insert that viral DNA into the host cell DNA. You also see that HIV not only has a capsid here on the inside, but also um, matrix proteins that are outside of that capsid. And then finally the viral envelope, which has these very important glycoproteins on the surface that are going to be used to attach to the host cell. And that's a very important step in the viral infection cycle. So it's going to per, um, perfectly fit into receptors on what are called CD4 cells. So let's quickly watch that happen in a video. I'm going to do a new share. And I'm actually going to narrate as this video is happening. Okay, so this shows you HIV. You can see the capsid here in pink. You can see the envelope on the outside with the important glycoproteins, two strands of RNA as the genome. Reverse transcriptase is already attached to that RNA, so it's ready to go once it infects the host cell. It's now going to come in contact with a helper T cell, which is one of the specific types of cell that it infects, because the helper T cell has receptors on the surface called CD4 receptors. And they are a perfect fit for these glycoproteins on the surface of HIV. Bad luck for us, good luck for the HIV virus. Now you're going to see a couple of steps here that you don't need to know the details of, but basically what these steps are going to result in is fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. So the HIV membrane is going to fuse with the membrane of that helper T cell Helper T cells are an incredibly important part of our immune system. They orchestrate what's called our specific immune response, our acquired immunity. So now you can see those membranes fusing. Now what's going to happen is the virus leaves the membrane proteins on the surface of the host cell. This is called uncoating. The matrix and the capsid are going to get digested. And now those viral enzymes and the viral genome are in the host cell. Right away, that reverse transcriptase is going to start converting that viral RNA to viral DNA. It has to do it twice. Remember that DNA is double-stranded, so it's going to get through once. You see it's using host cell nucleotides. It doesn't bring its own nucleotides with it. So it's using host cell nucleotides to put together that viral DNA. It now needs to go through another time to make the double strand, again, using host cell nucleotides to make that viral DNA. Now, an important enzyme called integrase is going to carry that viral DNA through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the host cell. And now life time infection is going to happen as that viral DNA is inserted into the host cell DNA. Now DNA polymerase from the host cell can be used to make viral DNA and RNA polymerase can be used to make viral messenger RNA, which is then going to leave the nucleus and use host cell machinery to make viral proteins. So here's a host cell ribosome on the rough ER in the host cell. The reason it's doing it on the rough ER is it needs to package this in a vesicle and carry this back to the host cell surface. 
These are going to be new membrane proteins that are going to be on the outside of the new virions when they bud from the host cell. So they're getting transported by a host cell vesicle to the surface. And they're just going to sit there for now into the, until those new viral particles leave. There are some other proteins that need to be made as well. So here's another piece of messenger RNA, and it's going to make a multi-protein chain that consists of several proteins that the virus needs. So the capsid, the matrix, along with the viral enzymes are all going to be produced. And those are also going to go to the surface of the host cell. So they are there and ready to bud as new viral particles called virions. And you'll see that happen. Here we go, there's budding. It's leaving wrapped in membrane. But remember that multi-protein chain still needs to get cleaved by protease into functional proteins. So this is part of the maturation stage. Now those proteins are going to fold. The virus is going to mature. So you're going to see the capsid and the matrix form. And now this is a mature infectious virion that can go on to infect other cells. Okay, I'm going to do a new share and go back to the PowerPoint. So HIV, HIV is a pandemic. So just like COVID-19 is a pandemic, just as we've had flu pandemics throughout history, HIV is a major pandemic. A pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. In other words, it's a worldwide spread of an infectious disease. As I mentioned in the video, HIV infects a specific type of immune cell that has what's called a CD4 receptor, and that's primarily our helper T cells. Those are the most important of the cells that HIV infects, and that's what cripples our immune system and can eventually result in what's called AIDS. HIV is the virus. AIDS can occur if HIV is untreated and that person's immune system becomes so compromised that they might not recover and could die from a secondary infection. HIV also infects other immune cells called macrophages and dendritic cells. You will learn what those cells do. If you take um, microbiology, you will learn about the immune system in detail and you will learn what those cells do. Helper T cells in a nutshell orchestrate what's called our specific immune response, our acquired immunity, eventually leading to production of antibodies. Okay, so they send this, the chemical signals that eventually result in antibodies and other aspects of what's called our immune memory, our ability to fight off specific pathogens. The very cells that would be normally fighting off HIV are the cells that are infected. That's why people die from a compromised immune system. And most people who die from HIV actually die from a secondary infection due to being so immunocompromised. HIV is still the world's largest infectious killer. So just because you don't hear about it on the news every day doesn't mean it's not still there. It is still the world's largest infectious killer. In 2019, so the, this World Health Organization data is usually about, you know, just under a year behind, but more than 38 million, so they're guessing upwards to 44 and a half million people are living with HIV worldwide. That is a lot of people. This is a big deal. You can see that it's mostly adults, but there are children who are infected. And you can see that globally, more women have HIV than men. That is significant. You can also just read some of these other stats. Um, the rates of infection are down compared to, you know, if you looked at 2000, so looking at 20 years ago, um, there has been a dramatic reduction in new cases, but it's still highly significant. 1.7 million new cases in 2019, that's a big deal. And 690,000, you know, that's a lot of deaths. And it could be more than that. That's just what's reported to the World Health Organization. 
At least 75 million people have become infected since the start of the epidemic and at least 32 million, but maybe almost 44 million have died. That's horrible. You can see the number of new infections is decreasing and you can also see that the deaths are decreasing, but it is still significant. 70% of the people infected with HIV live in sub-Saharan Africa and the US is tied for number seven. So if you look here, you wouldn't expect the US to be mixed in with some of these other countries, but we're tied with Uganda for number seven. That's a big deal. Okay, and this just shows a similar thing. You can see we're kind of right here in the middle. And in this picture, for some reason, we're lumped with Europe. Lots more people have access to treatment now than previously. That's the good news. If you look at 2000 and the percentage of people receiving treatment, it's about you know, half a turquoise person there compared to the percentage that we're receiving in 2016, and it's even more now in 2020. So that's really good news. It's called a lentivirus because it is a slowly replicating virus. It's called a retrovirus because it has an RNA genome. And it can eventually cause AIDS if left untreated. So HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus and AIDS stands for acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. AIDS occurs when that CD4 T cell count gets so low that the person's immune system starts to fail. And most people die to due to opportunistic infections. In fact, tuberculosis is the leading cause of death worldwide in HIV patients. How is HIV transmitted? This is a list of how it's transmitted. It can only spread if these fluids enter the bloodstream of another person. How can it get into a person's bloodstream? This is how. Okay, you really have to have a break in the skin or be injecting it directly into the bloodstream. Unless you're a baby. Okay, if you're a baby, you can get it from the mother during pregnancy. You can get it during childbirth and you can also get it from breast milk if you're a baby. You cannot get HIV through casual contact. It is not easily passed person to person like the flu. There's never been a case of a person being infected through eating with the same utensils, using the toilet, hugging, kissing, etc. It is not passed through saliva, tears, or sweat. It cannot be transmitted by biting insects, such as mosquitoes, fleas, and flies. Worldwide, more than 50% of the people who have it are women. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 58% of the people who have it are women. Women are twice as likely to acquire HIV from men than men are from women. And that's just due to the nature of the sex act. The skin can tear more easily in a female during intercourse than in a male. For women in their reproductive years, HIV AIDS is the leading cause of death. Most people do not know that. That is a big deal. This is US stats, 1.1 million. One in seven people don't know they have it. And we get about 40,000 new infections a year. The biggest increase right now is in this age group, 25 to 34. Any ideas why that might be the case? It's the same reason that all sexually transmitted diseases are on the rise. And that's because it's really easy for people to have sex with people they don't know by using certain apps and online dating sites. It's really easy for people to hook up. And people have started having unprotected sex again because they suddenly have this false confidence that HIV is not still a thing. It's not in the news enough. Sexually transmitted diseases being on the rise, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, things you hadn't even heard of for many years, chlamydia on the rise. People are having unprotected sex. They're not afraid anymore. 
And so this age group in particular has a high rate of infection right now. This is a devastating statistic. The number of children in Africa who have lost both parents to AIDS. There are some incredibly heartbreaking videos that you can watch on YouTube if you are interested. It's really a horrible situation. Testing is very easy now. It's typically just done with a cheek swab. It's important to realize that some people don't test positive right away, even though the tests are super sensitive now compared to what they were because it's a slow replicating virus. It can take time for your body to develop antibodies and that's what they are testing for is antibodies against the virus. Also remember that because it's your helper T cells that are infected, antibody production can be compromised for a little while until your T cells start to replicate and make up for the fact that there are infected cells. Treatment and prevention, two different things, right? Better to have prevention than treatment. Treatment means you already have it. And there are a lot of different things we have in our toolboxes now for treatment and for prevention. It's hard to read this, but this is PrEP. This is one of the biggest deals in HIV prevention because we do not have a vaccine. But if you have an HIV positive partner or you are in another high risk category, such as an IV drug user, you can take what's called prophylactic treatment that will hopefully keep you from becoming infected. It is also given to babies who are born to HIV positive moms. This slide talks about PrEP. It stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Okay, comparing that with PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. So as a healthcare provider, if you were accidentally poked by a needle or came into contact with blood, and you feared that you might have been infected, you could, after exposure, go get this medication. It needs to be taken within 72 hours after possible exposure to be effective. Okay, so if you've had unprotected sex, if you've been you know, pricked with a needle at work, if you've shared a needle with someone, if you are a victim of sexual assault, you should go get post-exposure prophylaxis drugs and it can prevent you from getting HIV if it's taken correctly and taken as soon as possible to give you the best chance of it working, okay? Pre-exposure prophylaxis is something that you would need to talk to your doctor about and you need to take it every day so that you make sure you don't become infected. So if you have a sex partner with HIV, Okay, if you have a sex partner or you've had sex with people that you don't know if they're HIV positive or not, or you're planning to do that, okay, or if you're planning to share um, injection equipment, it can reduce the risk by about 99%. And again, you would have to get that from your healthcare provider. So that all, both of those fall into the category of what's called ART, stands for antiretroviral treatment. So again, HIV is a retrovirus. Retro doesn't mean cool, retro means backwards. It's backwards because it has RNA as its genome instead of DNA. So PrEP, again, used for high-risk individuals, pregnant moms take it, and then the new babies take it also. Post-exposure, it's the same drug, but infants take it, and obviously anyone who thinks they could have been exposed. I'm going to skip this next slide. Let's talk about the HIV medications. This is really significant. Um, the number of medications we have now to treat HIV is hugely significant. It is no longer a death sentence if you have access to medication through your insurance. Unfortunately, a lot of the world does not. But most people who are HIV positive are on a treatment that 
is a multi-pill regimen or a single pill that includes a lot of different drugs. The idea is hit the virus at multiple stages of the reproduction cycle. So remember, entry infusion, we're part of the reproduction cycle. If you can stop that virus from ever getting in, it can't reproduce and you've essentially shut that virus down. Most HIV positive patients are not on entry infusion inhibitors. This would be for people who have failed other standard treatments. There are two categories of reverse transcriptase inhibitor. If you can keep reverse transcriptase from making viral DNA from the viral RNA, then there is no viral DNA to be integrated and that virus is shut down. This, by the way, the, the reverse transcriptase inhibitor is what PrEP and PEP are. These were the first highly effective medications that were used in the fight against HIV. We also now have integrase inhibitors. We have some really effective, um, not infective, but effective protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors have made a huge difference in our fight against HIV. So this would allow the virus to get all the way to the point where it's assembled and it has left the host cell, but if it can't cleave those proteins into functional units, it cannot be infectious. It can't go on to infect other cells. And then there are other types of maturation inhibitors that prevent that virion from being infectious as well. This is really significant because in studying how to stop HIV, we have learned a lot about other retroviruses and hopefully that is helping us currently in trying to develop a treatment for COVID-19. We do not have an HIV vaccination. Hopefully we will have a COVID-19 vaccination, but they have been for over 30 years trying to develop an HIV vaccination and have not been successful. This is just more information about how there's been a 40% decrease in new infections since the peak in 1997 and a decrease in deaths. This just tells you a little bit more about post exposure prophylaxis and I'm just showing this to you again because many of you plan to go on to be healthcare providers and it's very important that you always have it in the back of your mind. Safety, safety, safety. Air on the side of caution and even just you as humans we all make bad decisions at certain points in our life for various reasons. Just know that there is a drug you can take and err on the side of caution. If you've made a mistake, go get the medication to make sure you don't become infected because it is for the rest of your life. This just talks about vaccine development. And in 1984, U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary said we would have a vaccine within two years. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? Not trying to scare you. By the time you watch this, I'm hoping that we actually do have an effective vaccine for coronavirus. I will talk about coronavirus just briefly in a, another video. So you see coronavirus coming up here. I'm going to talk about it in another video. So that's I, HIV. It is a big deal. It is still the largest killer um, by infectious disease on the globe and the largest killer of women by infectious disease on the globe. Keep in mind, heart attacks and cancer are non infectious diseases. So we're talking about the deadliest infectious disease. Okay, thanks.